welcome once again to Sid Cordell. Uh, well, the election is um, upon us, uh, but I'll tell you what, it's happening in France, Sid. Yes. My goodness me, uh, this is a genuine French revolution, but it's spread beyond that, it's going to the rest of Europe. But let's be honest, Sid, we're the only nation going to the left. What's up with us? Well, it's interesting because... Um... France is very, very divided. I mean, although, yeah, maybe, but um, I actually think in, in in this country, you know, there's no massive enthusiasm for the Labour Party, but, I mean, we'll come to that later, I guess. But if you look at France, I mean, it actually turned out that they've got three blocks. I mean, they vote in blocks because because that's the only way it works. And um, they've got the, the right-wing block, which is like the National Front with 34%. They've got the left-wing bloc, which includes Greens and the far left and the communists, and that got 28%. And then they've got the centre bloc, which is Macron's party, which got 21%. Now, it's very, very interesting the way the system works in France, because at the end of the first round, which they've now had, they then move on to the second round. And the only way people can get elected in the first round, is they get 50% of the vote, which uh, I believe about 80 candidates have actually got 50% of the vote across France. Um, so they're elected. They've got no second vote. The uh, But the, the majority, there will be a second vote. Um, they have a rule that you can only get on the ballot paper in the second vote if you've got 12.5% of the registered voters. So it's not it's not twelve and a half percent of the vote. It's twelve and a half percent of the voters. Oh my but, goodness me! This sounds like PR on steroids. Well, it's, it's it's a very interesting system. So basically, what actually happens in practice, obviously, is this favours the larger parties because the smaller parties will find the struggle to get twelve and a half percent of, and also it depends on the turnout. Well, in most French elections, they'd have had a turnout of about between fifty and sixty percent. But in this election, uh, yesterday, they had a turnout of over 70%. So because they had such a high turnout, obviously, it's easier to get 12.5% 12, 12 of the registered voters. So, whereas normally, they only have about, uh, about 50 or 60 constituencies that have a three-way election in the second round, because they had such a high turnout, they reckon it could be as high as 350 constituencies that have a three-way vote. So that is going to favour the far right, because if it's a three-way vote and the, and the uh, party with the highest number of votes gets elected, then they got 34%, which is significantly higher than the other parties across the board, they're likely to actually get the majority of people elected and form government. Now, what the left-wing hope is that they'll form some sort of alliance with Macron's party. Their 28 will quickly become 48. And um, on that basis, they'll win. And they've already announced that uh, in any constituency where they're in third place, they'll stand down in favour of Macron's party. Now, that will obviously help Macron. However, Macron hasn't said that in any constituency where they're in third place, they'll stand down. They've said quite the opposite. They'll continue to fight because they basically said that the far left is just as bad as the far right. So if that actually happens, that could actually help Macron. So we could yet still have a situation where Macron comes out with a large number of, um, of, of MPs, even the majority even though they only got 21% of the vote in, in the first round. So it's, it's still everything to fight for. And there's still a lot of tactics left to, um, to be seen. But I, I think it, Macron is absolutely right. I think the far left is worse than the far right, frankly. Both are terrible, but there's no reason for Macron to say, oh, yes, the far left is better than the far right, so we've got to stop the far right, and it doesn't matter about the far left. No, sorry, it does. <laughs> Well, if we take it away from the number we first thought of, I suppose we get somewhere near the truth. And now, what about the rest of Europe? It seems to be going to the right. Well, except Hungary, of course, which where, where a right-wing government got a bit of a bloody nose. 
But um, yes, yeah, certainly in Germany, um, the the right wing and there's several other countries by the right wing. Italy, by the way, as well, which has got a um, a right wing government. It's not a far right, but it's a right wing government, and they did extremely well in the European elections, um, even though they're the incumbent government. That which is very interesting because um, that goes to show that you know. <laughs> In, in power, the party in power doesn't have to be unpopular if they rule well, um, which maybe bring us back to the UK, I guess. <laughs> well, with a hard landing, let's take uh, Nigel Farage and uh, NEC. A massive audience. No other leader's got an audience like that. And yet, did he mess it up? Should he have kept his mouth shut about NATO, about Putin? Oh, yes. I mean, I think he's completely wrong on that. Totally wrong. And see, you've got to remember that Nigel Farage was actually working for um, Russian television before the general election. So um, he has actually been absorbing some of the Russian propaganda. But there's no question whatsoever that the Russian propaganda is just lies, from my perspective, without a shadow of doubt. Well, he I mean, says that, to be fair on him, uh, Sid. I think Probably you've seen the recent recording uh, of uh, Major General Tim Cross assessing what is going on in the Ukraine and what would be the possible outcomes. It's not pretty, Sid. No. Uh, everybody's saying, well, look, let's give Russia a bit because this war will last forever. Maybe Nigel's got a grain of truth in all this, you know? Yeah, well... We're talking about two different things. I mean, the first thing we're talking about is what provoked the war. And Nigel Farage was saying the war was provoked by Ukraine wanting to join NATO and the European Union. That's what he was saying. Now, that is wrong, totally wrong, because he's basically saying that the Ukrainian people did not have the democratic rights to vote for a candidate that supports the EU and NATO. That's what he's saying, because if they did, then it provokes Russia. No, I'm sorry. I mean, that's basically says that Russia can veto the democratic process in Ukraine. I mean, that's just completely and utterly wrong. And that, but that is absolutely why uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, because Ukraine voted in Zelensky and they hate Zelensky and they hate what he stands for. I mean, that's why the war took place. But to say that Ukraine couldn't be allowed to vote for the people they voted for is just perverse and wrong. I'm sorry. But then another question is okay where do we go from here and that's probably probably where we need trump in the white house because he's the only person that can actually knock heads together and say right okay um this is where we are now this is where we've got to go we've got to end this war and this is the only way we're going to end this war my proposal is bang if you don't accept it then um i'm going to come down very hard on the country that doesn't accept it i mean he said that within 48 hours of him becoming elected president he said i don't have to be president i can just be elected president so people know i'm going to come into the white house he said um i can end the war and i i think he's right because he's he, he can he's able to come put together imaginative solutions that basically forces both sides to uh, to accept. He is a deal maker, Trump. It's his, it's his skill. Um, and Biden, frankly, has made no attempt, right from the word go, to, uh, to bring any sort of peace proposals together to end this war. None whatsoever. I mean, well, which is let, let, utterly shameful. Can, can, can we stick with Biden a little bit longer? And um, apparently he's been given a week. Uh, to allow his wife to whisper sweet nothings in his ear and say, uh, Joe, it's time to give up. But he wants to cling on to power. It's more complicated than it looks because they've never really had a situation like this in America and the various protocols that exist for impeachment, inverted commas. You can drive coach and horses through that lot. But who's any better? Newsom from California? OK, well, first of all, I think we've got to understand a little bit what's been going on. You see, Obama was a very strong president for the Democrats and served two terms, got re-elected with um, quite, a, quite a good vote. And it was expected that Hillary Clinton would follow on after him, and she was quite a strong candidate. Um, but... What then happened was that Obama actually publicly said 
that he wanted somebody in the White House that would be a figurehead where he could actually pull the strings from behind the scenes. That's what he said. I mean, it's not me suggesting this is what's happening. That's what he said he would like to happen. And all the appearances that Biden hasn't actually been running the country. He's been a figurehead. Someone's been pulling the strings. And it appears that Obama's been one of the key people behind the strings. I mean, I'm not sure it's only Obama, but I think it's him and other people that have been pulling the strings behind the scenes and telling Biden what to do. And you can see this has been going on because just to take one example, I mean, but Biden was a Catholic and the whole of his life he was anti-abortion. But suddenly now he's president, he's completely shifted and he's now rabidly pro-abortion as Obama is and as most of the Democrat Party is. So it's not what Biden wants that goes, it's what he's told to, to say that goes. On, on everything, on everything. But that's just one clear example. Now, we've come to a situation where he's been in power for almost four years. Um, nobody else was able to um, to uh, counter him during the primary process. So he's been selected as a Democratic candidate for the next four years. Presumably, they're planning to operate on the same basis in the past. But Biden has now become such a weak figurehead I mean, such a hopelessly weak figurehead that the farce can't continue any longer, pretending that Biden is actually running the show. I mean, they can't pretend he's running the show any longer. So they've got a major problem. They really have got a massive problem. I mean, what they would like to do, I think, is maybe introduce another figurehead. And they may think that Kamala Harris could be a, a, another figurehead. Oh, she's be... not very popular with anybody, I don't think, Kamala. <laughs> she isn't. But she is also extremely weak. And she's also probably somebody who would do what she's told to do if she was president. So they may think that she could be a figurehead. But um, they, may, they may think they could bring in Michelle Obama and that she could be a figurehead who would um, be a popular person, maybe who could win the election. and But you see, the thing is, because they can basically, they've got a system in place where they can manip manipulate the votes, they don't have to be a popular candidate. I mean, they can have a candidate there who is relatively weak, but they can still win the election by manipulating the votes. That's what they believe. So, but you see, they've got themselves in a terrible mess, frankly, because the public perception of Biden now is so absolutely appalling that, um, you know, they've really got to try and find somebody else quickly. Sid, is it a truth or a half-truth that um, our election on the 4th of July, their great day of celebration, of course, over the water, theirs is on in November, that is far more important to Britain than the 4th of July is. No, I don't agree with that. I mean, we are absolutely an independent country and whoever's running the, the um, government here is very important. Now, I mean, it is true that um, we do appear to be building up a, a strong deep state. And in my view, the deep state is centered around the Quangos, which I've talked about in the past, as well as the civil service. And um, it's very clear to me that the Conservative government over the last nine years or so, certainly to, since 2015, I mean, between 2010 and 2015, we had a coalition government, and that was very weak. But when we've had a Conservative government on its own since 2015, they haven't been running the show. I don't think they've been running the show. But nevertheless... Um, the deep state in the UK has been able to do much less than they would be able to do if we had a Labour government. Because if we had a Labour government, they'd be pushing us hard back into the EU, back into the, to, to the World Economic Forum, following the World Health Organization agenda, following the whole transsexual agenda, all of that stuff, which this government, the Conservatives have resisted, although they've gone along with some of it, um, we'd suddenly have a, a government that wouldn't be resisting it at all, that would, would be actually promoting it. And there would be a big difference. There really would be a big difference.
Well, looking at the uh, spaces in the sentences, let's call them, that are being uh, spoken of and hidden uh, by the Labour Party, it is clear that they've got to raise taxes because A, Labour always do, and B, we're in a mess. So we've got to get the money from somewhere. And it is um, even by left-wing commentators suggested that CGT, capital gains tax, will certainly go up. Inheritance tax will go up. And there's a real nasty here. There is talk, we know, about them including farmers, so they won't be able to pass on their land. There's talk about the small businesses not being able to claim, let's call it family relief, and therefore will be subject to inheritance tax, which will wipe out about half of the small businesses, which don't forget represent more than 50% still of the economy in the United Kingdom. There's lots of other things that are hidden that are coming out. It's not simple, Sid, because you've mentioned Europe. There's a soft absorption going to happen without a doubt. So Kia is going to go along and make education and tie it up with what Europe does in education. Then there's a workers' rights that he'll adopt in Europe for Britain. Then there's the food standards that he'll adopt for Britain under the guise of, oh, well, we've got to do good trade with Europe, even though actually the trade with the rest of the world has now overtaken the trade we do with Europe. Lots of things are going out and coming in that people are not aware of. And it'll be too late when they get in, Sid. We've got at least five years. I agree with all of that. And I think that um, a Labour government will be very dangerous and we will be very bad for the UK. But as I was saying earlier, I don't actually think among the ordinary people there's a great enthusiasm for a Labour government. I think they've had enough of the Conservatives and um, they want them out. Um, and um, I think there's a certain amount of enthusiasm for um, for reform. Um, but Nigel Farage, I don't think he's um, strong enough across the board um, and positive enough in many ways across the board um, to uh, be the next prime minister. I mean, he himself has actually said we're not going to get elected, which is, I think, you know, he does come out with some stupid things, Nigel Farage. He'd be, he'd be much better if he'd actually said, you know, we're in front of the Conservatives now in several opinion polls. Um, it's, um, it's very clear the election is now between reform and Labour. And um, people have got a choice. They're either going to have a reform government or a Labour government. So if you don't want a Labour government, you've now got to vote for reform. I mean, if he was saying things like this and, you know, and, and we want to get in, we want to run the country. We could run the country way better than the Labour Party. If he was saying things like this, that's what that's the message that you ought to be getting out. Instead of that, he's saying, oh, reform are going to beat the Conservatives. Sorry, um, Labour are going to beat the Conservatives. They're going to form the next government. We want to form the next opposition. Well, that's hardly an inspiring way of voting for reform, is it? I mean, you know. But Nigel Farage, I think, is very, very weak when it comes to predicting what's going to happen across the board. I mean, he's, he, he, he predicted that um, we were going to lose the EU referendum in 2016. And then, you know, his, 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 um, his prediction now that uh, well, Labour are going to beat the Conservatives and we hope reform might reform the opposition. I mean, you know, it's, it's just a very weak way of campaigning, frankly. I wish I was in his shoes, because if I was in his shoes, we'd be having a much, much stronger message. I mean, my message would be we need our policies to run the country. And, you know, and, and if, if people vote for our policies, they'll have a way, way better government than what anything that the Labour Party offer, plus anything the Conservatives have offered in the past. Sticking with Europe again for a little bit longer... Um, the older I get, the more I am perplexed about how people, as a nation even, can be hoodwinked. And even mention the word democracy as being part of all this. Mm -hmm. It is not democratic. Now, if we believe in democracy, which 
most of the people, the vast majority of people in any country, honestly believe in. You've only got to look at the way Europe functions, and at least Nigel got us out of Europe. So well done, Nigel. But let's go into the de democracy and how Europe works. I mean, you've got a massive talking shop, and that's all it is. You can elect an MEP in there, but forget it. The real decisions are made by the dreaded elites. And, oh, well, you can overturn a decision, we're told. Well, that is true, actually. But you've got to get every one of the 27 members in Europe to agree. And that has never happened in world history. Not everybody agrees with everything. It is totally non-democratic, Sid, and we're being hoodwinked. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I mean, that's why it's important we should leave the European Union, because the whole, uh, the, the whole structure is completely and utterly undemocratic. Um, you know, yeah, it is, it is a good thing that we've left the European Union, but the Labour Party, if they get back in, are going to, uh, like you said earlier, are going to basically be shattering all of EU rules and uh, we'll, we'll basically be preparing the circumstances where it's easy for us to rejoin because we've uh, aligned all our regulations with EU regulations and we've aligned all our policies with EU policies across the board. I mean, that's basically their plans and their, atten in, and their intentions. Let's define elites while we're on the subject that seem to be controlling us. Nigel's come up with a definition, might not be your friend, but I'll tell you what, he gets certain things right. And I think he's right. And it's not just the globalist big people that go to Davos, etc. The great majority of the elites are part of the civil service, not the whole lot of it. There's a massive swathe throughout our universities, massive, that influence the civil servants, that influence governments. How you sort that lot out, I don't know. But one universal thing is that they don't have much of a moral compass. They've got well, a compass towards Marxism, but little else is it. What's in it for them? Are they just after a comfortable lifestyle? Do they truly believe what they are saying and inculcating in our young people? Because it's the young people that are following them. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, what's behind this is evil, basically, but it can take different forms. I think one form undoubtedly is New Age. And for people that don't know, I mean, New Age was put together by uh, by um, Alice Bailey, really, in 1924. And she was writing masses of books and she put forward the 10 uh, objectives of the New Age movement, which included promoting homosexuality and making it a normal lifestyle, um, destroying Christian marriage, um, taking control of children before they're 10 and turning them against their parents, all this sort of thing, and including um, uh, basically getting hold of the church and making the church, getting the church to adopt all these proposals that they're making. Um, and you see, all it's basically fundamentally anti-Christian, and a lot of the roots of the uh, of the United Kingdom have been Christian roots. I mean, even the king, uh, this king, when he became um, king in the uh, coronation ceremony, you know, swore on the Bible, and we had, you know, readings from the Bible which were basically acknowledging that God created the world, which is something they won't even teach as a possibility in schools, let alone as the truth. But, um, you know, this, this was actually read, you know, by him all things are made. And without him was not anything that was made. You know, in him is life, and the life was the life. And this was actually read in the coronation ceremony. Now, they hate those beliefs. They absolutely hate them. But I think Marxism is also involved because, you know, part of Marxism is infiltration. And you see, in my mind, undoubtedly, in a lot of key areas of society, the effects of Marxist infiltration, not least in the church, but you certainly see it in, in universities um, and, and you see it in the civil service. And you see that being used to direct the country and you certainly see it in the Labour Party as well. I mean, you know, but 
that the, what tends to happen in the Labour Party is that Marxists rise to the top, and then when they rise to the top, they're rejected, and then and then the ordinary working man in the Labour Party tends to exert a bit of influence, and then it goes in a cycle. But the Marxists are still there, and they're still wielding a north of influence. And I believe Keir Starmer was also almost certainly one of them. But you have to remember that a key part of what they stand for is to hide their true objectives. So they don't come they don't come clean and they say our objective is to destroy the capitalist system and our objective is to get rid of all the Christian influence from the country. They that they they say our objective is to improve the economy and to so on and so forth. Um, but hiding what their real objective is. But undoubtedly, w- whether it's New Age, whether it's Marxism, whatever it is, it, it is absolutely anti-Christian. And the only thing they've got in common with the Muslims, who are anti-homosexual and, and, and anti a lot of the things they stand for, the only thing they've got in common with the Muslims is a hatred of Christianity. I mean, that literally... And because if you delve into what Islam stands for and what the New Age and Marxists stand for, it's complete opposites, complete opposites. But because they've got in common a hatred of Christianity, they're able to work together. And the Muslims also have this thing about not telling the truth. So they also hide their objectives. So you've got the New Age and the Marxists hiding their objectives. You've got the, Muslim, the Muslims hiding their objectives, but coming together with a hatred of Christianity. And this is what's going on, you know, and you see, as Christians, as true Christians, not, you know, the Church of England, you know, but as true Christians, we have to be wise as to what is going on, which is why I put a very important chapter in my book, you know, Authority Over the Nations, God and Politics, was the satanic agenda. And understanding a lot of it is just, a lot of my book is understanding what's going on and what we're facing. When we understand what we're facing, we have to understand that it's basically a satanic agenda that we're facing. We can deal with it a lot more easily than if we just think, oh, it just we don't understand why this is happening. We don't understand what's going on. Yeah, on that theme and back to Sir Keir, um, after the cast report, everybody left, right, centre was saying, oh, yeah, uh, we've gone over the top here. Uh, this seems to be a good idea. Let's um, call trans what it should be called and stop this nonsense. But it's not. It's coming back. And it's clear Sir Keir wants it back. And the other thing he wants back, of course, is getting rid of this horrible phrase, conversion therapy. Now, that's been unknown for donkey's decades uh it's stopping people getting help yeah but it's fundamentally it's also the objective of conversion therapy or sorry the objective of of outlawing conversion therapy is outlawing prayer i mean that's the key thing and it's the same with um, people outside abortion centers you know we've got to stop people praying they're arresting people for praying outside abortion centers i mean you know it's supposed to be the idea of a you know public sector protection order you know we, we've we've got to stop violence or whatever it's supposed to be but they've got not a single shred of evidence of any violence ever committed by anybody outside an abortion centre that's that's anti-abortion. The only violence has come from people that are pro-abortion, um, that have tried to be removing people that are anti-abortion. And there's no, no violence whatsoever from anyone that's anti-abortion. You know, so the whole thing is just complete nonsense. But the real objective is to outlaw prayer. And on conversion therapy, you see, we've had a situation, if you don't mind me just saying this very quickly, we've had a situation in the Christian People's Alliance in this last week where one of our candidates, uh, who's standing in Leeds, um, her and her husband are wonderful Christians. But their two, Christ- their two children, who they brought up as Christians and even paid for them to go to a Christian school, both rebelled against their parents. And the daughter said that she was lesbian, and the son said that he was gender fluid. Now, this was a matter of prayer for us because obviously it was very concerning for the parents and first thing that happened was that the daughter came round 
and she abandoned lesbianism completely. And she's now uh, uh, with uh, a pastor's son and and uh, and a completely committed Christian. What happened in this past week is that the son also came round. He was living gender fluid for two years, completely cut off his parents, refused to even talk to his parents, let alone visit them. Um, but what actually happened was that um, Janet's uh, mother died. So Daniel's grandmother died. And he said, I want to come to my grandmother's funeral. So that was the first time they'd actually spoken to his parents for years. So he came to his grandmother's funeral and his grandmother's funeral was completely reconciled to his parents, is now back living as a man and has completely rejected the whole concept of gender fluidity. Now, you see, if you just take that one family with those two children, you can see very clearly that they've gone down a path, lesbianism in one case, gender fluidity in the other case, but they both turn around and come back. Now, if you pass this law against conversion therapy, it would actually be illegal to, act, to, to talk to these people and to help them, to either of them. It would be illegal. So if someone actually, I mean, I, I actually had some correspondence with both of them on Facebook, but I could have been, I, for, for what I was saying on Facebook and saying, you know, your parents love you, you know, and what the path you've gone down is the wrong path. I could actually have been arrested by the police for saying that. I mean, what utter nonsense. What utter, utter nonsense. But you see, that their testimony, which I've just shared, is proof, and it happens across the board, that people do go down one path of lesbianism, gender fluidity, whatever it is, transsexualism, and then turn, right, turn back. There's masses of examples of transsexual regret, masses of them. It's difficult to talk about it with the laws in the United Kingdom and other countries indeed. But you've got facts that the LGBT movement uh, are always uh, putting out. It's at least 10% of the population that are homosexual. And that is nonsense. And anybody can prove that by going to gov.uk and looking at the last census. It's way below 2%. If that indeed. Sid, we are being kowtowed and bullied in this. I believe personally uh, that we should have a proper in-depth survey of what is going on here in Britain, because we have evidence that in the schools in particular, children going through a difficult stage, which you've just mentioned to children going through a difficult stage, are persuaded that it's normality and it isn't. Totally. And at least 8% of the 10% are in that category that should not be following the rainbow flag. It is diabolical. And as you've mentioned, it is a deeply spiritual battle. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, you see, but the thing is, you see, simply from an intellectual point of view, um, the path that they're trying to take us down is nonsense. It's, that is why the cast review is so valuable, because you've got somebody there who's done rigorous research, and as a result of rigorous research has basically said, young people should not be given cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers or surgery. Um, they're too young, and um, that is the wrong path to take them down, you know, because there's been numerous people that go down one path when, they, when they're teenagers, but then change back. Um, so making it irreversible is, is completely inappropriate. Now, you see, that is research. And this is, the, this is what we need, frankly. This is what we've got to go down this path, because we've got to be able to prove intellectually that the path that they're trying to take us down is just, is just scientific nonsense. And we can do. It's easy to, because it is scientific nonsense, frankly. The idea that once you're homosexual, you can never change back, or once you're transgender, you can never change back, is utterly scientific, intellectual nonsense. Moving on, Sid, I've got a thought for the day here about the election. And it says, uh, with the Tories being in such a mess, that 
the best result would have to be a minority Labour government. That would perhaps get us out of the um, proverbial doo-doo. Well, um, my, my, my hope for the election is that we have a hung parliament. Uh, whether we have a hung parliament with a Labour majority, I don't know. But you see, um, some people have talked about 1974, which I can remember. I was only 18 at the time. But if you remember, in February 1974, we had an election. And the Labour Party actually ended up with five more seats, I believe, than the Conservatives. It was almost equal. But because they were the largest party, they took power. And then they were only managed to last eight months. And then we had another election in October 1974. But in the second election, um, they got more votes. So I, I, don't, I don't think it will be a good thing if the Labour Party are able to take power, even with a minority government. It would be a lot, I think it'd be a lot better if we had a, a genuine hung parliament where they were unable to form a government which has happened in other countries. It's happened in Holland, for instance, where they've been trying to form a government for ages, um, you know, and really struggling to form a government with lots of different parties and trying to put negotiations together. Right. My hope would be that after the election, they start negotiations and it takes a very long time and no one party is able to form a government for a long time. To such an extent, they have to go back to another election. OK. Let's tackle another difficult subject and one that is in the background of many people's minds, but they may not want to admit it. Rishi is Indian. Allegedly, there are quite a number of people in Britain, some people are quoted 20%, that would not vote for anybody of that ethnic origin. Now, it may be prejudice, it may be we're a Caucasian white country, we should vote Caucasian white. Now, that's not our view, but there is a significant portion of the electorate that will carry that view. Secondly, this last weekend, Rishi has been getting blessings from his priests and publicising it. That perhaps is not the wisest thing to do and would encourage these thoughts about should we really be voting for somebody that has not got the generations uh, behind him of Britishness. OK, now I think we've got to be very, very careful with what you're saying here. Um, for me, it's irrelevant, the fact that um, Mr Shunak is of Indian origin. But it's not irrelevant that he's um, a Hindu and he's actually putting Diwali things outside number 10 and asking for blessings from a Hindu priest. I mean, we do have to bear in mind that in India, where Hindus dominate, they have been viciously anti-Christian and have actually been persecuting Christians and, and, and knocking down churches. So there is clear conflict between the Hindu religion and the Christian religion, I'm afraid. I mean, Hindus basically believe in a multitude of gods and they have no problem saying that Jesus was God or Mary was God and so on and so forth, um, which which can be confusing. I don't think Hinduism generally is, is as anti-Christian as Islam is, but it is certainly anti-Christian. And I'm, I'm, I am concerned about the spiritual effect of having Sunak as the Prime Minister of the UK. In my mind, there's no question Sunak has got to go. And um, I'm hoping that the Conservatives will get enough seats or that somebody like Kemi Badenoch can come in as the new leader of the Conservative Party and, and she can be in discussions with the other parties about forming a government. That's what I would hope will be the outcome. But I certainly would hope that the outcome of this election, whatever happens, is that Sunak will resign as leader of the Conservative Party. Another thing we've got to talk about is um, out-of-work benefits. Now, the whole world comes over the channel, of course, because we're king of the benefits in giving them out at least. 
And we've noticed in Spain here a big change since the European thing came along and since socialism had taken such a grip on a country, this is quite left-wing now. And um, the way it's manifested itself in Spain is that there never used to be a problem getting anybody to work. Some people cruelly say perhaps, oh, well, you need someone on employment because otherwise it's not healthy. Getting people to back to work is not easy, especially in a socialist regime. Are they going to be very soft on this million people that we desperately need to work and that are not working because it's too comfortable to be on the couch watching television? Well, I have to admit that um, I do see um, within our society um, a lack of discipline, which I think was very clear when I was a, when I was a child. Because I think when I was a child, I mean, if I was born in 1956, which was just 11 years after the end of the war. And I guess at that time, society was very disciplined. And I think I was brought up in a very disciplined society where um, people went to work, people observed Sunday as a, as, a, as a day of rest. I mean, it was it was the law and um, crime was generally at, at very low levels. I mean, because I think of, of the shock of what happened in the war, um, people were very focused on working for the country and, and solving the problems and and defeating Hitler and rejoiced that Hitler was defeated. Um, and um, and I think, you know, even though they voted for a Labour government and afterwards, nevertheless, there was still a strong discipline in the country. Now, as time has gone on, and obviously we're now a long way from, from the last war, I mean, we're now 80 years down the line, um, that discipline in our society is something which is just not there anymore. And the work ethic, I think, or the lack of a work ethic is one of the results of it. And it's not held by the fact that some companies have overworked their people. And to the extent that you find some companies that are getting people to work weekends and late into the night and so on and so forth to, to, to make money. And um, there's, there can be a reaction against that because it's like, OK, you're just working people too hard. And that's not right. So, you know, can, I'm not. Can, some people might well be saying, you know, I'm not going to sort of be putting the hours that my father put in. I'm not going to do that. I want to have a more enjoyable life. But what is clear is that there is work available for young people, and um, and quite quite well paid work available for young people. Um, but I don't think that this generation is working anything like as hard as the former generation across the board. Well, we've had Glastonbury, have we not? And it seems to be a big success, Coldplay in particular. But what isn't a big, big success is the spin-off and the number of Palestinian flags by one has to say, you've got to be fairly rich, inverted commas, to go to Glastonbury these days, by the middle classes, is mind-boggling. Sid, why don't we get the truth? The truth about Hamas and co is very simple, but the mainstream media don't seem to get a grasp of this. We're tied up in complications, but... We should support the Palestinians. Well, well, hang on, it doesn't take going back much years to, in fact, 17 years. There was no problems out of Gaza, or very few problems compared with now. Then suddenly Hamas overtook the country, killed thousands of people, and have ruled that country for 17 years, and they're still killing. And they want to see every Jew dead. And these stupid people are waving Palestinian flags. Now 70% of the Palestinian nation either are cowed uh, or actually believe in the Hamas lie and are supporting Hamas. Now, these are the facts. But why should we tolerate all these marches and demonstrations that we do in the United Kingdom? 
Okay, well, I, I, th I agree with everything you've said, um, but then you've posed me a question at the end about marches. You see, I, I think, to be quite honest with you, um, it's wrong to uh, clamp down on freedom of speech because people are saying things that we don't like. And I certainly believe in a right to demonstrate. And, you know, I've taken in part of a lot of demonstrations. I take part every year in the in the rights, you know, in the uh, March for Life, March Against Abortion. I've taken place in demonstrations against the Incitement to Religious Hatred Act, against assisted dying. You know, I've, I've taken in part in a lot of demonstrations. And I think it's important people should have the freedom to demonstrate. And, of course, for 10 years, I went down to Speaker's Corner, where we have open debates with Muslims. And you know, I think open debate, debate, demonstrations, I think they're a good thing. Uh, the only thing that should be stopped by the police is when they demonstrate, when they uh, go into violence. I mean, if there's violence on the demonstration, then that, that the demonstration should be stopped. And equally, if people are calling for violence or supporting violence, and some of these demonstrations have, and I think if there's clear evidence where people are supporting violence, or encouraging violence, then the police should step in and say, I'm sorry, but we cannot have anyone supporting encouraging violence. But you see, the thing is, because um, the whole thing situation is muddied and people are saying, oh, you know, we're just demonstrating in support of, 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 of the Palestinians against what the Israelis are doing, um, then obviously that's something which I, I've got, you know, people have got a right to do that. What they don't have a right to do is to call for Jews to be killed, which is, has has happened in some of these demonstrations, unfortunately. And I'm afraid that is part of Islam. And that is what the police should clamp down on. OK, finally, Sid, uh, did you go to church yesterday or did you uh, worship at the Shrine of England? <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday. I uh, left my house at half past seven and got to church at half past eight. We had uh, various pre-meetings before the church service properly started at 10. Uh, after the church service finished at half past 12, we had a baptism service, um, baptised 11 people. And after the baptism service finished, I drove to another church where we had a 60th birthday party. And I got home about... Uh, 20 past five, uh, which the England match had been going on about 20 minutes. I went, then watched the rest of the first half. I didn't particularly enjoy what I was watching, so went and did computer work uh, after that. Well, there we go. I can see his halo from here. Listen. <laughs> um, we well, since you asked the question, I thought I should give you a full answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we must say, yeah, as I said on many occasions, woke never wins and how can you get more woke as we've mentioned in the past than gareth saying to the nation uh and to his players uh and to the fans over there uh you've got to love uh, england you've got to love this football team i can see that going down so well with the average guy over there with a pint in one hand and a, an english flag in the other i mean it's so woke and stupid and that was put out on the football field, wasn't it? So we had this one-off, wonderful kick, uh, overhead kick, or sideways kick even, that saved our lives in the last minute. Woke never wins, it won't win. Hope I eat my words because I'm a patriot, but uh, I don't think it will. Uh, we're miles behind other teams, Sid. Well, I don't know. I mean, I listened to uh, Jude Bellingham's interview afterwards, and uh, I think it's quite interesting hearing what he was saying, because he said um, people expect us just to replicate our club form immediately when we're on the international stage. But it's not always straightforward because we have, you know, we have different players that we're playing with. We have a different manager. We have a different system that we expected to play. And it, it, it takes time to adapt to, to that system. And um, we don't necessarily immediately play brilliant football um but of course you can say well why can't why doesn't that same principle apply to spain or to i mean you could say it's applied to italy because of course italy have done dramatically badly at this tournament having been being the holders i mean they've already been knocked out but spain seemed to be performing brilliantly 
Yeah, it was um, a pleasure to watch them as well. It's not a pleasure yeah. to watch England. Well, it, it, yeah, it, England are England have been have been struggling, um, but you know it's we'll have to wait and see. I mean, they've played four games now; they've won two and drawn two, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, whether they continue to improve, hopefully, as the tournament goes on, they'll get better and better, which is with what Jude Bellingham saying is right. You know, will happen. I thought, by the way, that Bellingham himself, right from the beginning of that game, from what I was watching. He was a far more committed and far more lively than he was in some of the previous games. I mean, for instance, at one point, I saw them just playing the ball across the back, which seemed to me to be crazy the way they're just playing it across the back. And I get very suspicious that all they're trying to do is to get their own personal statistics of, of accuracy with passing up. Because if you, you know, if you pass accuracy, you say, well, you've got this player's got 87% passing accuracy. Whereas if they get the ball and then and then knock it forward and it and it doesn't uh, come off, then they say, "Oh well, that's an inaccurate pass." But if it does come off, then they score a goal. They say, "Well, we, we'd rather have an accurate pass and get my passing statistics up." But I mean, that's why I'm suspicious about, it and I don't like it. But I did notice that they were doing that, and Bellingham himself, who was right on the front line, literally came right back and got the ball. And having got the ball, he then just ran forward with the ball and made something happen. Um, but, you know, I, I saw Foden do something like that as well, because he was fed up with them just watching them pass the ball from, you know, side to side. He literally came back, got the ball and ran forward with it. Um, so, you know, it's like those, those two players, Foden and Bellingham, I think have actually been, well, Bellingham's been very poor up to this game. This game, he worked hard. He really worked hard. And Foden has been working hard right across, right for the whole for the whole championships. A lot of them seem to be just going through the motions. Yeah. Well, from all this, of course, we've got to say that both Gareth and Ricky have got to go. Sid, thank you for your inspiration. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>